The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 62 Ancient Anger. A faint glow appeared in the distance. Almost there, said Earl, and he snuffed the lantern. Jenner's eyes adjusted to the, as the light grew stronger. The others sat up, all but Poto, and peered over Earl's shoulder. Moments later, they saw a pale blue circle that grew as they sped nearer. Hold on, Earl said. The boggan burst from the tunnel, flew through the air for a heart-lurching moment, and slammed into a pile of soft snow. Janner could see nothing but white. Cold, wet snow invaded every opening in his clothes, and he didn't know which way was up. Oh, sinks alive! Sinks alive! said Oscar somewhere nearby. Then strong hands pulled Janner sputtering from the snowbank. Several more of the big, bearded Chimerans helped Naya and Lily to their feet. Poto crawled from the pile and dashed to the upper deck of the ship without a word. Welcome, Earl, said one of the crew. Is everything going according to plan? So far, said Earl as he climbed from the snow. Gammon wants us out to sea as soon as possible in case things go badly. Clear the snow bed from the deck. Loose the moorings. The crew sprang into action. Janner was too thrilled to wonder what was wrong with his grandfather. He was on a ship. He heard the muted splash of water, then the wonderful creak of timbers. On either side of the ship rose tall, smooth walls of ice. If the boat hadn't been there, the boggan would have splashed into the water. There was no shore, not even a stray ice flow. Beyond the prow, the corridor opened to the wild sea. Waves boomed against the ice cliffs and shot foam high in the air. The sails unfurled, the crew hauled on fat ropes, the oars churned, and the ship creaked forward toward open sea. Janner craned his neck and squinted upward at the fine sight of the mast and the mainsail unfolding in a spray of sunlight. Then he saw something that caused his face to break into a wide smile. Far above the mast, a winged creature approached. Two human legs dangled behind the wings. And though it seemed impossible, Janner knew it was his uncle. Pete's familiar screech cut through the sky, and Janner whooped with joy. Look! he cried as the ship inched forward, and the prow met the first waves of the sea. It's Uncle Pete! And Tink! They made it! Janner waved at them and was thrilled to see Pete wave back. But as his uncle neared the mast of the ship, Janner realized he wasn't waving in greeting, but in warning. A mighty thunder shook the air, and cold water rained down on the ship. Naya screamed. Even some of the brave Chimeran warriors screamed. Above it all rang Poto's strong voice. Lords of the sea! I'm Poto Helmer! Scale raker, they called me! You know my name, and you've justly cursed it these many years! I beg you, let your wrath fall on me and me alone! Janner tore his eyes from the sky and spun around. Sea dragons erupted from the waters and towered over the ship. Their eyes glowed red as embers and their mighty flanks trembled. The beasts dwarfed the ship. Their fins churned beneath the water and rocked the boat like it was a toy. Poto stood at the prow with his arms raised. The nearest dragon, the old one Janner had seen in his first vision, the one who had spoken in his mind thrust its head forward, bared a mouthful of silvery teeth at Poto, and loosed a roar that told the old man's coat from his shoulders and caused the ship to list to port. Poto stood firm, wet with sea spray and sweat. Something thudded into the rear of the ship, and Janner turned, expecting to see another sea dragon. But it was no dragon. A gray fang climbed to its feet where it had slid across the rear deck and slammed against the stern rail. It drew its sword and growled as two more gray fangs shot from the hole in the ice wall and crashed to the deck of the ship. However the Chimerans fared in the battle far above, the fangs had discovered the escape tunnel. Three more gray fangs thudded into the rear deck in a tangle of fur and weapons and found their feet. Faster! roared Earl. Get the ship clear of the tunnel! By the time the ship's nose was into open sea and into the throng of dragons, and the stern was clear of the tunnel mouth, Fifteen gray fangs prowled the deck with teeth bared and swords slashing. 
Earl and the seven members of the crew, not busy hauling ropes and oars, engaged the fangs with shouts and much bravery. Behind the ship, more gray fangs splashed into the water. And though they were bitter enemies, Janner felt pity for them as they thrashed in the water and clawed futilely at the smooth walls of the cove. Then the dragon's voice filled Janner's mind. It said the same words that had spoken that day on the cliffs. But now he knew whom it meant. He is near you, young ones. Beware. He destroys what he touches and seeks the young ones to use them for his own ends. We have been watching, waiting for him. He sailed across the sea and he is near you, child. We can smell him. It wasn't Nag. It wasn't Gammon. The dragon's warning had been about Poto Helmer all along. It was young dragons who were in danger, not he and his siblings. Janner was stunned. He knew Poto had been a pirate, and before that a strander, but he had never stopped to consider the awful things his grandfather might have done. Awful things that weren't just a part of some story, but had actually happened. But to slay the young of these magnificent creatures? Naya was right. Wicked people would do anything for money. He didn't want to think of Poto that way, but there was no escaping the brutal fact that his grandfather had done this terrible thing. The dragon roared. The crew battled the fangs, but they were losing. Several of Earl's men already lay motionless on the deck of the ship. The gray fangs, unlike their scaly brothers, fought in silence with precision and great skill. The rest of the crew scattered to protect the ship from the blooming ice walls. Others fetched bows and trained them on the sea dragons, though it was obvious arrows would be of no use. Oscar lost his footing and sprawled on the deck, slipping to and fro like a dead fish. Naya's mouth hung open in a silent scream. Lily, however, tucked her crutch under her arm, hopped up the stairs, and raced across the upper deck straight toward the dragon. Janner snatched a sword from the hand of one of the fallen Chimerans and wondered whether he should hide, leap into the battle with the Grey Fangs, or follow Lily to the forecastle where Poto faced the dragons. The old dragon writhed in angry triumph, and its frenzy spread to the many dragons behind it. They roared and churned the waters until glaciers split and avalanches tumbled down from the sides of the stony mountains. Poto stood like a statue in the prow, awaiting his death. Dark wings suddenly blocked Janner's vision, and he found himself looking into Artham's eyes. Janner? he said. His voice was strong and sure, and it cut through the clamor. His face was the same, though now colored with the same reddish tint as his forearms. And instead of wild white hair, fine feathers shaded with subtle color and design covered his head and shoulders. He was beautiful. Uncle Artham, how did you... what happened? I'm not sure I can explain it myself, Artham said. Janner, there's no time. Take your brother. In Artham's arms lay a gray fang, small and motionless. It wore no clothes, but its body was covered in long gray and white fur. Janner couldn't hide the disgust on his face. This wasn't Tink. This was a terrible mistake. Then the fang stirred and turned its head. Janner's blood ran cold. Neither the fur, the pointed ears, the black nose, nor the sharp teeth could hide the fact that this was indeed Tink. Janner didn't want to touch him. He didn't want to believe this was his little brother. Drop your sword and take him, Artham said. He needs you now more than ever, Throne Warden. The dragons will kill us all if we don't do something. Janner nodded and took his brother into his arms. What will you do? he asked. I'll start by dealing with these wolves. Artham snatched up the sword Janner had dropped, then spread his wings and leapt into the air. He dropped into the center of the fight and killed three gray fangs before his feet touched the deck. In seconds, the Chimerans had the advantage and backed the six remaining gray fangs into a corner. Destroy them, said the dragon's voice in Janner's head. It was talking to the other sea dragons. Destroy them all! I can see that you're angry! Spare the others! It was me who took your children! Poto bellowed. He knelt on the prow and clenched his hands, and his big, broken voice rose above the chaos. 
Please! The sea dragons would crush the ship and swallow every one of them, all because of Poto, all because of the wicked things he had done. It was no more use trying to stop the dragons than trying to stop a rack of dark clouds blowing in. Nothing in all of air we are could stay such bitter vengeance. Faster than Janner would have believed possible, the old dragon struck. Like a whip, the beast's head reared back and shot forward, straight at Poto and... Lily! Naya shrieked. The little girl reached her grandfather and stood between him and the dragon. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 63 Whole Wind's Trophy. Stop! Lily said, and the dragon did. It froze so close to Lily that she could have reached out and touched the tip of its nose. And she did. For the first time in an age, someone touched a living dragon. Seawater washed down the sides of the dragon's slick face and puddled on the deck. Its mouth, full of teeth longer than Lily was tall, was stretched open to eat Poto whole. The old pirate knelt with his eyes closed. Janner sensed that the dragon was speechless with surprise that this wavy-haired little creature would have such courage. The tips of her delicate fingers rested on the dragon's nose. She looked calmly into its eyes, though they were as big as wagon wheels and deep as the sea. A little burst of air from its nose blew back her hair. It was your song that fell from the cliffs. Yes, it was her song, Artham said, and Janna realized his uncle could hear the voice too. Artham broke away from the chimerans at the stern, flew to the prow, and landed where Poto knelt. Lords of the sea he said with a bow. Before you stands the song maiden of Anaria. The dragon blinked, and again its thoughts were spoken in Janner's mind. Impossible! It's true, lords, said Artham. Anaria has fallen. The dream is ended and the world is dark. If the dream is ended, said Artham with a flap of his wings, how do you explain these feathers? How do you explain Lily's courage? How else could I hear your words if I were not a throne warden? It is true the Shining Isle is smoke and ashes and that darkness is wide over the land. But your long memory has failed you. Of all creatures, you should know that the darkness is seldom complete. And even when it is, the pinprick of light is not long in coming and finer for the great shroud that surrounds it. The dragon was silent. Artham beckoned for Naya and Janner to approach. Naya took Tink from Janner's arms and rested his furry head on her shoulder, holding him close like she had a thousand times when he was very young. Janner was ashamed to admit he was glad she took him. He didn't like the feel of the fang fur or the eerie change in his brother's features. It was a reminder that the throne warden had failed. No matter what anyone said, though he knew it wasn't true, Janner would never escape the feeling of responsibility for what had happened to his brother. And then he began to understand something about his uncle. It was guilt that drove Artham P. Wingfeather mad. Naya climbed the steps with Tink in her arms, and Janner followed. They stood beside Poto and Lily, all of them wet and cold, shivering in the blustery sea wind. The heart of the kingdom stands before you. Behold! Artham said with a sweep of his hands, the pinprick of light. The dragon brought its head low and studied each of them in turn. When the giant eyes settled on Janner, he fought the urge to kneel as Poto had done. The beast was as old as mountains and its gaze was heavy. When it looked at Lily, she smiled and curtsied and it bowed its head in return. The dragon's eyes fell on Poto again and a rumble issued from its chest. Our anger is deep. However, for the sake of the old friendship with the Shining Isle, and for the Song Maiden's spirit, the ship may pass. Our thanks, Sea Lord, said Artham with a sigh of relief. He squeezed Poto's shoulder and whispered to the others, They're letting us go. Thank the Maker, they're letting us go. 
The ship may pass, the dragon continued. But Scale Raker is ours. His offense is great, and we will not so easily let him tread our waters. Long have I ached to foul his flesh. No, Janner moaned. Please, Artham said. What did it say? Tell me, Naya demanded. Hush, lass, said Poto. He looked up at Naya with a gentle smile. Me voyage is over. I knew the sea had nothing but death and shame for me. Couldn't bear to lay me eyes on it all these years. I knew sooner or later me waters would carry me back here, and there would be a reckoning. Quiet, Naya said. I'm too angry at you to let you die. This reckoning is nothing of what Mama would have said. To have kept this, to have kept this hidden from us. To have done these things. She knew, Poto said quietly. What? Mama despised the dragon hunters. She hated what they did, Naya sputtered. Die, Poto said, and so do I. Hate it more than you ever could. Many's the time I wished I could go back and fix it all. Undo the things I'd done on the strand and on the sea. But when your mother gave me her heart, I left the old poto behind and said goodbye to the sea. I never thought I'd see the ocean again once I married your ma in the green hollows. But then Esben chose you as his queen. Remember how I sent you and your ma ahead and waited till winter before I crossed the strait to Anaria? Yes, I remember, Naya said. I was scared silly that the dragons would rise up as they have now. The dragons took me leg. And they knew me sent. T'was a miracle I made it across the strait to Anaria, and I made peace with never setting foot on a ship again. Broke me heart, but I'd broken plenty of others and saw it as me just penance. Then Nog the Nameless attacked, and that storm blew us across the scree. I thought the dragons would gobble us up on the way, but I reckon the Maker had different plans. All those years I stayed at the cottage on Dragon Day, because I couldn't bear to look out at the wide horizon and knew I'd never sail it again. Listen, daughter, I'm glad beyond telling you that it's just me they want. When we came out of that tunnel, I thought for certain me deeds would be the end of you all, too. But they're letting you go, Naya, dear. I'll go to the deep happy knowing that. Enough, said Naya. She rounded on Artham. You tell these dragons I'm the Queen Mother. This is my father, and I pardon him for these crimes. They must let him pass. Artham hesitated. Tell them, Naya snapped. The dragon's chest rumbled again, and its eyes narrowed. Janner had the disturbing sense that its patience was wearing thin. I don't have to tell them, said Artham quietly. You just did. They understand you. Naya, don't, said Poto. I've done things that ain't been paid for. And it's time I stopped running from that. Listen to the old man, said the dragon. It says, it says you should listen to Poto, Naya, Artham said. No, she said with all the authority she could muster, clutching Tink so tight that he whined. The dragon was finished listening to Naya. It reared its head and hissed at them. The other dragons writhed, the ship rocked, and it seemed they would break the vessel to pieces and swallow it whole. Please, sir, said Lily to the dragon. Isn't there something that can be done? The dragon's answer was a name. Holwen! It said, Come forth, daughter. Let these grovelers see what Scalebreaker has done. A ruby-red dragon rose from the waters at the old one's side. It was half the size of the others and swam in a graceless lurch. As it approached, the, dra the gray dragon drew back to allow it room. One of its eyes was missing. A long, twisted scar ran from the top of its head, past the missing eye, to the corner of its mouth. One of its fins hung limp, cut into shreds. In several places, its scales were twisted and corrupt where, Janner guessed, harpoons had pierced it long ago. Instead of a row of fine, glimmering fangs, teeth were missing or stuck out at odd angles. Poto shook his head like a child. 
I beg ye, masters, please don't. I can't bear it. The creature hung its mangled head over the deck of the ship, turned its good eye on Poto and grunted. Janner waited for its words to fill his mind, but none came. Lily and Naya hid their eyes. My daughter, said the old dragon, who was once as beautiful as the rising moon. My daughter, whose many scars came from Scale Raker's blade and the spears of his henchmen. Janner felt sick. It was one thing to learn his grandfather had done terrible things. It was another to see those terrible things with his own eyes. And this was only one of the dragons he had attacked. Janner tried to look at Poto, but couldn't. Do you remember her, old man? He wants to know if... If you remember her, Artham said. It's the old one's daughter. Poto shook his head. Then remember this, said the old dragon. Show him all win. The ruby red dragon sighed. Show him! The smaller dragon dipped her head into the water. When she emerged, she spat something at them. A clean white bone clattered to the deck where Poto knelt. Me leg! He whispered. He looked up at the red dragon. It was you! I remember! Oh, maker, I'm so sorry! Oh, when? Vengeance is yours! Said the old gray dragon. Kill the one who killed so many!